you strong. Well, Damo, the Tokyo Olympics, unfortunately, now are in the rear vision mirror and obviously we've got the Paralympics to come. But we thought we'd take the opportunity in this episode to talk about the, the successes of Australia at Tokyo and how, firstly, how great it was to see so many Australians on the podium and also the successes to win as many gold medals as we did and, and a record tie with Athens as well. But we, what we know from the conversations we've had is that you obviously don't just turn up on the day and win a gold medal. And the preparation and the execution for these Olympics can happen basically from two Olympic cycles ago. So I think it's pretty important, mate, that we talk about the events that led up to the successes of Tokyo and hopefully try and break it down a little bit. Yeah, so as you said previously, if we go back even further than that, and the most successful sort of cycle for Australia was the 2000 and 2004 Olympics, which as we were hosting Sydney 2000, like many other countries, Japan did very well this time around. A lot of funding and preparation goes into making sure that you as the host country does well. I think what happened after Athens was that sort of we'd had Sydney, we'd done really well there. Athens was really good. That nothing really changed in terms of how we were preparing the athletes and, and how it was done, which sort of led into a bit of a decline in, in Beijing and then London where funding wasn't increased and the facilities remained the same. So after London 2012, there was a big review done by the AIS at the time who were running all the Olympic sports. And they came up with this plan called the winning edge, which was from 2012 to pretty much now 2022, they, they set some targets for the Olympic team. So at the summer games that we're talking about, the, the aim was to be in the top five the com games to be number one and then they wanted 20 plus world champions per year this was all set up in in 2012 and it, what happened was instead of the ais running it how we had in previous um, olympic cycles so for athens and beijing and and london the transition was to move it away from the ais and give power back to the national sporting organizations and the state institutes of sport to essentially prepare athletes for the olympics what probably happened for Rio was this, this was done pretty quickly and there wasn't really a lot of time. So like, if you think back to, to Sydney, the AIS had been running since like the late seventies, early eighties. So there was a fair bit of run in time to the Sydney Olympics. There was only a three year turnaround when they, they pushed this back to the NSOs and the state institutes of sport. So what we probably found at Rio was that giving the power back to the state organizations and, and the national sporting organizations was that, they didn't really have, they didn't even have a full Olympic cycle to prepare their athletes. I mean, it was sort of a new starting block. So what we found is that Rio, they didn't perform as well as possible, but as part of this winning edge, there was actually an additional pressure in the fact that the AIS had set it up that the funding model for the winning edge was based on performance. So rather than all sp sports, being funded based on participation numbers or, you know, level of hierarchy, it was based on performance. So regardless if we had one athlete or, you know, 30 athletes like the swimming squad, there was a prediction made for how many medals they should get. And then if they didn't reach that at the Olympics, then the funding that they got was going to be distributed differently. So for example, one of the, the parts of the squad at Rio that had the most pressure was the swimming team. So we saw at Tokyo how well they did. At the Rio Games, there was actually, which the public didn't really know, there was actually a set number of gold medals and medals that they had to win to maintain their funding, which then puts pressure on the athletes to perform because if you don't perform, then your sport essentially doesn't get the same level of funding and then come around to 2020, they weren't going to have the same level of high-performance facilities, staff and everything like that to prepare. So it was kind of thrown back on them that they were under the pump to perform which didn't go down very well. And the swimming team didn't get the allocated number of medals. And then it came out in the media that this was actually what happened. So shortly after the Rio games, they restructured the model to not be based on performance targets. It was rather to be based again on participation and allocation based on, you know, what, what sports actually needed and their sport, the sporting organizations themselves actually planning that rather than the AIS telling them what funding they would get. So that kind of gives you a bit of, context as to what was happening leading into 
Rio and then probably what's happened since then. So if we move on from there, this winning edge cycle come into Tokyo actually had eight years of run into it. And mm, it's probably yeah. it's probably why we, we've done so well is that the power was given back to the sports and the state institutes. And what that enabled was that the funding and the facilities and the high performance coaching, rather than being available only to your top achievers, so those in the Australian national team or those selected by the AIS on scholarships, it was now made available to essentially every state's institute of sport and also the um, national sporting organization. So what it allows for is a greater pool of athletes to actually be, I guess, provided the services. So rather than just being those top level athletes, it now runs down further into sort of your youth development. So athletes that at the Rio games that, you know, were in their teenage years who are now, you know, performing at the Olympics for us in 2020, they were picked up in that system and they got that high level of coaching because it had streamed down into um, each of the states, which again, just allows for a greater pool of athletes to be coached and trained at that high level, which as you can see, sort of has translated into more medals. Well, that's my sort of understanding of why that would happen because they've changed, changed that model and, and enabled more athletes to be looked after essentially. Interesting. Man, that's a really good summary from, basically a decade's worth of change and organizational structure. So you've obviously done a lot of research into it and I know you're pretty interested in the topic as well. And so when we think about that decentralization of the AIS, that's essentially what, what's happened, hasn't it? And that isn't a foreign concept either. There's I think, is Team GB, when they had the Olympics, they followed a similar process, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, they're, they're still following that model and they're yeah. sort of been the world leaders. New Zealand's done something similar where it's no longer one governing body that looks after it. They've sort of given the power back to the sports and the states. In the UK, it's called TAS and yep. essentially it's like a talent identification pathway. And that's actually run through universities and major sort of sporting facilities around the country. So rather than, you know, having to go to your national sporting center of excellence or the AIS essentially, for example, there's a big emphasis in the UK on, on their athletes also studying. So universities around the country are actually set up to be TAS providers. And so as part of your education, you also then get provided with the elite athlete services of, you know, high performance training facilities, strength and conditioning coaches, physiotherapists, sports scientists, all that are sort of included as part of that. And each university has those facilities and it, it doesn't matter really what sport you're in. Obviously there's universities that have the facilities for particular sports, but you can sort of be based anywhere around the country in the UK and, and that TAS program will help facilitate your training. Um, so that's sort of what Australia has gone with now that now the the sporting organization. So for example, um, football federation, Australia, each state based um, partner of that. So in Victoria, where we are football federation, Victoria is then responsible for providing high performance services for um, athletes at the senior level and then in the pathways. And so that's where it's happening is it's actually filtering down to those athletes and more athletes are being identified and more are being putting into these, into these high performance programs, which you know, in, in a sport, for example, like swimming, where we did so well at this Olympics, this is probably where it was most important, where there was just a greater pool of athletes that were then identified and getting that high performance service rather than just those that sort of were on the radar or did well at the national trials. Absolutely, mate. It's, it's outstanding insight from you, really is. Now, we both looked at an article from Mark Portis, didn't we? It was a well-written article. It was very, very good, actually, looking at what's happened, obviously, sort of similar to the summary you've provided and then going to, into the future. What, in terms of a decentralized system, what's some of the, the benefits you, you would actually, you actually get from that? So you've spoken about it briefly there, but in terms of innovation and having your own control, like how profound is that benefit as a, a national sporting organization? Yeah, I guess the thing was when it was run by a centralized party in the AIS is that, they had to select like areas that they thought would be most beneficial across the board um, for multiple sports. So the AIS still is primarily run for research and innovation, 
but when they were covering all sports themselves, they sort of had to make sure that that research and innovation was applied to a particular sport. When you give that power back to the individual sports and institutes of sports means that they can actually focus solely on either the athletes that they've got there or the sports that they're working with. So for the NSO, so that's national sporting organizations for them, they can focus solely on their individual sport and start innovating and researching. And, you know, it might be building better facilities for their sport with government funding or looking at training techniques or, you know, how to innovate performance so that they can look at the one percenters in their particular sport rather than the AIS having to look at the one percenters for 30 different sports, which mm. just isn't feasible and, and costs a lot of money. So I think that that's probably the big thing is that while the funding is probably not the same, like not every sport gets the same level, they are able to still work on what they specifically need rather than waiting for the AIS to maybe drip feed them something that might be applicable to them. Interesting. And then so you've done a really good job there of talking about all, obviously all the organizational structures that have went up into to now. And when we look at Tokyo now as an example of an execution of that structural change and all the processes in place, there was one thing that really struck me. I watched an interview with Harry Garside. So the bronze medalist in boxing, Australia's first medalist in boxing for about 30 years or something like that, 40 years. And he spoke highly of this program called the Gold Medal Ready Program. So I hadn't heard of this before the interview I saw. And so I did a bit of research, a bit of digging into it. And I was pretty impressed with what I found. And there's a lot of information on the AS website about the Gold Medal Ready Program. And it's, it's a very, it looks like it's a very good and, and thorough program and what it does. And effectively, to summarize it, essentially focuses upon the mental side of performance. So not just obviously the physical performance, but in terms of execution, dealing with fear, anxiety, doubt, pressure, all these different things that can affect an athlete's mental performance. And it seems like in this program, they've done a lot of work targeting that side and being able to execute in the face of such pressures. Have you had much of a look at this, Damo? I've, I've seen a little bit about it. And I know this Winning Edge project that I've spoken about, after there was a bit of uproar about that funding model, they sort of changed how they were going about it and and part of it was that the AIS took a big step back and we're actually going to only focus on what they call true podium athletes so rather than focusing on every athlete in every sport is that they were going to focus on athletes that were a, a sort of a guaranteed chance of getting a medal um, and I think this ties in with that that role as well, that this is where they're sort of looking at those athletes that are sort of towards the top echelon and providing them with additional services, um, perhaps that their state uh, or national sporting organization can't provide. Um, so I think that's where that's falling in, in the AIS's role within this. Yeah. Interesting. So for those who probably aren't aware of it, I'll go through maybe a few different aspects of the program briefly on what it is. And so the first aspect obviously looks at the mental performance there. So if you have a look at the AS website, we'll post a link as well. So you can have a look at it for yourself. There's a lot of, there's a nice, I guess, an explanation video there that talks about the the different sort of aspects of the mental performance curriculum they go through. So talking about those different uh, aspects we talked about and anxiety, stress, pressure and handling them and and acknowledging the existence of those sort of feelings and then still overcoming that and helping to, to help execute on the big stage. And then they also have this other, another stream which I really like and it's using gold medal alumni. So effectively having previous athletes who have won a gold medal and using them as a bit of peer support, I guess, is what you could call it. So, which I think is a really good and innovative idea. So effectively getting you know, peer mentors and hopefully similar sports or wherever it might be and, and talking about their ability to execute and win gold medals on, on the big stage and, and some of the challenges they dealt with. So I think that's a really really good and positive way to, to help instill that, I guess, the belief in, in people in coming through that they have the ability to achieve those goals and objectives. And then the last one is a commando style boot camp. So Harry Garside specifically referred to this and thanking the commandos, which he worked with. And I've had a bit of a look at this one as well. And they're effectively stress simulation activities. So they put into place, some, so effectively allowing athletes to put into place some of the coping strategies they've learned in difficult challenges, which is facilitated by some army activities. looks a lot like boot camp sort of stuff. So I thought that was a very interesting 
and obviously successful sort of initiative. And it's not it's something I'm, I'm sort of understanding with. So the Melbourne Storm, they typically do a, a boot camp style pre-season camp for first year players to the club. And that's been run for as long as I can remember, as long as Craig's been there, uh, certainly. And they rave about the success of that camp and how effective it is for players going forward in terms of their belief. So, mate, I think there might be some sort of something in that. And I guess in the ability to reflect upon your abilities and your ability to overcome that stress in the face of adversity and still perform, there's got to be something in that. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how many of our medal-winning athletes yes. have been involved in that program because um, we have spoken about how... Um, obviously a lot of the power has been given back to the, the state institutes of sport and the NSOs, but obviously the AIS yeah. still has that role, as I was saying, with these podium ready athletes. So it, it would be good to see the stats on that, to see if this was a major contributor to it, or if maybe the whole overhaul of how Olympic sports done in Australia mm. has sort of contributed to that. I think it's, it's a mixture of both, but this, the psychology is obviously a huge thing. And as you said, like people from the outside of the storm rave about how, how good that program mm. looks and is effective. And I know they've tried it in other sports. I know uh, my brief sort of work at Cricket Victoria, they generally do some sort of boot camp style and preseason as well. And it's across a few of the other States as well. So it's obviously something that, does work, but it would be interesting to see the stats on that for Tokyo. Yeah, and absolutely. Med- I reckon, align with it. Yeah, absolutely. I reckon it'd be a great, a great statistic to see and, and would justify, you know, obviously the initiative that they're putting forward. But I reckon, mate, it's a, it's a comprehensive. I love that how it's focusing on that mental aspect of performance. And there's a lot of, obviously, resources gone into that because it's an, obviously an important measure in the performance as well. So clearly it's worked and it'll be interesting to see how that carries forward in the Paris. And the last one, Damo, we obviously need to talk about, which is the elephant in the room, is COVID. So the effect of COVID in these Olympics. Now, obviously, given it's provided an extra year of training in the Olympic cycle, it's, it's very interesting. And there was one aspect I wanted to talk about specifically was for our swimmers, so our swim team. So obviously, the majority of our swimmers would be based in Queensland, New South Wales, or in terms of like our, our medal winners anyway that we've seen. Given 2020, there weren't really any lockdowns there compared to somewhere like Victoria. So I was wondering how much do you reckon that would have an influence on, you know, on the performance as well, like getting or having a consistent macro cycle into the Olympics? Yeah, no, it's certainly a good point that you make there, Rob. And I think uh, the additional year probably aided our swim team as well. Um, a lot of them yeah. are probably that extra year of training and preparation put them in great stead. If you look at the results from the 2019 world championships, we probably weren't on track to win as many medals as we did, but that extra year of training and preparation I'm leading into is certainly helped. But yes, you talk about that being here in Victoria, like to start off with athletes weren't allowed to do anything at all. It was not until their sort of permits were put in place, which would have significantly affected people's training preparation here in Victoria for a sport like swimming where pools essentially have been shut the entire time there's been a lockdown so yeah unless you had a pool at home or you you had that special athlete permit to train it would have been incredibly difficult to do so obviously athletes in that in that case were significantly impacted um, mm. we did have a quick chat before this as well as such as like indoor sports so like um, yeah basketball track cycling something track cycling is one that we actually normally perform quite well at, at the yeah. Olympics, and we probably didn't mm. do as well as we have in the past and maybe that is a contributing factor that they weren't able to get to velodromes or train as as properly as they would have normally so i think you do make a great point that uh, fortunately our swim team mm. um were there if if it was this year and with sydney and mm. brisbane being in lockdowns maybe it was a different story so um it is a great point you make there and I think the other thing as well is who you who you train against in terms of your world class opponents. If you don't have that regular competition, obviously it's going to be ideal if you have other world class people there to push you along. And so the swim team is obviously very deep, as we saw at the Olympics. And so having those training partners there would be pretty good. And I think that extends to maybe track cycling. If you you can't actually get overseas or you can't regularly compete against other nations in the velodrome, and that's obviously a bit of a disadvantage. I'd say basketball is an interesting one. So particularly the NBA players for for Australia that, that we had there, the NBA still played in, in a bubble essentially you know, during last year. So there's still 
that opportunity, I guess, for our NBA talent to play, which obviously helps. But again, when you're coming as an individual into a team, then there's, there's some difficulties with that already. So it is interesting, man. It's fascinating. Hopefully we've, we've covered a little bit there and hopefully there's of use anyway, Damo, out there, considering the amount of research you put into it. Yeah, I, I hope that we have provided some insight as to why I guess we think we did so well at, at, at Tokyo. Um, I think like we talked about just that long-term plannings come together. Um, it was a 10 year plan and obviously we're sort of at the back end of that now. So you'd expect that if it was a successful program that you'd bear the fruit at this stage of it. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in doing my research and reading. It looks like they're, potentially looking at going back to a centralized program again after this 10 year cycle ends in 2022. So that'll be interesting to see how that goes, um, especially with Paris sort of being in there. So hopefully it's not like Rio and we have that short turnaround and change around from processes that they're following. Absolutely. Well, I guess we're going to have to uh, wait and see on that front, aren't we, don't we? But mate, you've been outstanding today. You've covered a lot of, a lot of topics there and a lot of thorough uh, research. So well done to you and, We'll, uh, we'll have to wrap it up there, but, mate, outstanding stuff from you today. Thanks, Rob. Good stuff from you as well, mate. <laughs> oh, that's all we've got time for today, but thanks for, thanks for tuning in and, and watching. Appreciate it. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe on all the other things we've got going on across the uh, different platforms, but we'll see you later.